For millions of years, this lake thrived. But now it is dying. Poisoned by humans who put themselves above nature. It's time to stop the killing. It's time to heal our planet. It's time to remove your footprint. Agenda 21 is coming soon. Thank you very much. Um, I want to tell you how excited I am to be here tonight to see all of you. And it's not just because you've come here to hear me speak, but it's because <coughs> meetings like this are taking uh, place all over this country. Uh, <laughs> and it was not very long ago when that was not true. There were four or five of us talking about Agenda 21 over the last 15 to 18 years to very empty rooms. And in the last year and a half, that has changed. And I'll tell you, when you walked in this door tonight, you joined a revolution. And I thank you for that. Yeah. <laughs> now, to lay the proper foundation for our discussion today on Agenda 21, let me begin with this quote from Ayn Rand in Atlas Shrugged. Quote, when you see that trading is done, not by consent, but by compulsion, when you see that in order to produce, you need to obtain permission from men who produce nothing, when you see money flowing to those who deal not in goods, but in favors, when you see that men get richer by graft and pull than by work, and your laws don't protect you against them, but protect them against you, when you see that corruption being rewarded and honesty becoming self-sacrifice, you may know that your society is doomed. And I think that sets the stage very well to discuss Agenda 21. Now, the official word is out about me. According to several newspaper reports from around the country, I am only here to spread wild conspiracy rumors to scare you into fearing your benevolent government. <laughs> Guilty as charged. <laughs> well, you all know that something is very wrong in America. Every day, government at all levels grows ever more out of control, more intrusive in our personal lives, more of a threat to private property, all in total and flagrant disregard of the expressed will of the electorate. The fact is, America has grown, Americans have grown to fear their own government. Life is getting harder. There is less optimism about the future. The once prominent phrase, the American dream, seems to have been dropped from our vocabulary. The reason? America is going through what Al Gore called a wrenching transformation of society. Now those are powerful words. But what was he talking about? What kind of transformation? What has changed? And where does that transformation originate? How does it directly affect your daily life? The old structure of what was once the United States of America is being replaced with a new political and economic order that is drastically changing the very underpinnings of the nation. These are being replaced with a new ruling authority created to mandate proper conduct for every citizen in a newly organized society. Now there's a radical statement. It's being done quietly, behind the scenes, without debates, without votes, and with no official announcement. Yet these new, this new ruling authority has become the official policy of the federal government, of every state government, and is moving rapidly into nearly every city, town, and county in the nation. The ruling authority is called sustainable development, and is, it's the blueprint for transforming human existence, and it's fully outlined in a UN document called 
Agenda 21. I've had 18 years of experience to study every aspect of sustainable development in Agenda 21, and I have learned that it is an absolute threat to everything free Americans hold dear. And here's what I know. There's a new language taking over government. The typical city council meeting discusses comprehensive development, density, historic preservation, and partnerships between city and private business. Civic leaders organize community meetings run by facilitators as they outline a vision for the town enforced by consensus. Free trade, social justice, consensus, carbon footprints, partnerships, preservation, stakeholders, land use, environmental protection, development, diversity, visioning, open space, heritage, comprehensive planning, critical thinking, and community service are all part of that new language. What are they really talking about? What mental pictures come to mind when those words are used? Where was such language first developed? Well, the term sustainable development was born on the pages of a United Nations document called Our Common Future. That was the official report of the 1987 UN World Commission on Environment and Development. As a result of this report, for the first time, the use of environmental protection and human development were tied to the age-old socialist goals of international redistribution of wealth. And that is the key to understanding the true purpose of sustainable development in all of its policies, control of all facets of the economy. Here is how the UN described Agenda 21 in one of its own publications in 1993 in an article entitled Agenda 21, the Earth Summit Strategy to Save the Planet. It said, quote, Agenda 21 proposes an array of actions which are intended to be implemented by every person on Earth. It calls for specific changes in the activities of all people. Effective execution of Agenda 21 will require a profound reorientation of all humans, unlike anything the world has ever experienced. I've never read a more powerful statement of a purpose for government. And yet, when you and I point it out and protest against it, we are attacked as fringe radicals. Astounding. Here is the exact course that brought Agenda 21 to America and into our local community. The infrastructure pushing the sustainable development agenda is a vast international matrix. At the top of the heap is the United Nations Environmental Program, the UNEP. But the UNEP doesn't operate by itself. Influencing it are thousands of non-governmental organizations or NGOs. These are private groups which seek to implement a special political agenda. Through the UN infrastructure, particularly through the UNEP, these NGOs have great power. And I should point out that true NGOs are groups that are officially sanctioned and certified by the United Nations to participate in these international efforts. They don't just announce we're a new group and we're going to go and do this. They have to fill out an application that's about that thick. And they have to pledge that they are going to be true to the goals of the United Nations. Prior to the 1992 Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro, these sanctioned NGO groups spent considerable time writing and creating the document that, the, that would be introduced to the world as Agenda 21. At the Earth Summit, nearly every head of state signed agreement to follow Agenda 21, including George H. W. Bush. Agenda 21 is not a treaty that has to be ratified by the Senate. Rather, it's what's known as a soft law policy, a guideline that the nation agrees to implement through its own legislative process. And that's the reason why it is so difficult to follow it from the UN down to your city council. There's been an array of things in between. President Bush 
in signing the document committed the U.S. to implement the policies of Agenda 21. That sent the policy to our federal bureaucracy, which started to set it in motion. Agenda 21 then gained huge momentum when in 1993, President Bill Clinton issued an executive order to create the President's Council on Sustainable Development and make it official U.S. policy. Take a look at who served on that council, and you will see many of the same NGOs which helped write Agenda 21 for the United Nations. They include Jonathan Latch of the World Resources Institute, one of the three most powerful organizations influencing the UNEP. Also on the President's Council were John Sawhill of the Nature Conservancy, and Jay Hare of the National Wildlife Federation, and Michelle Perrault, International Vice President of the Sierra Club. All players in the creation of Agenda 21 now openly serving to the, on the President's Council with a specific mission of implementing Agenda 21 into American policy. And there's an even more direct connection between Agenda 21 and our federal government. Listen carefully. Included at the UNEP table to develop the policy along with the, all the NGO groups who helped write it are these players in the federal government. These include the Department of State, Department of Interior, Department of Agriculture, Environmental Protection Agency, National Park Service, the U.S. Forest Service, and the, U and the Fish and Wildlife Service. These agencies send representatives to all UNEP meetings. It costs millions of dollars for them to do that. They spend hours and hours and hours there helping write policy. Now, why do they do that? If Agenda 21 is just a myth that has no effect on our government. You might remember a great deal of discussion during the Clinton administration about the idea of a reinvention of government. Vice President Al Gore was put in charge of that reinvention, and that should have been our first clue. <laughs> the invention, of course, was sustainable development. The purpose of the President's Council was to translate the guidelines of Agenda 21 into public policy to be administered by the federal government. And that step-by-step -step process translated into the ruling authority through which a UN plan, Agenda 21, has become unquestioned U.S. policy throughout the nation. It was invented by NGOs through the UN. It was brought to the U.S. through the President's Council. And through federal and state legislation, it is being implemented on the local level through the involvement of those same NGOs who helped write it. They started at the top, they surrounded the, the people who wrote the legislation on the federal level. They moved to the state level, knowing full well what that legislation was and all the strings attached to it. And they got the states to pass legislation that made the, the local governments put these programs in place. And then they went into the local communities and they put the pressure on your local officials. That is the path that got it into your neighborhood. Sustainable development is not a local policy or local idea. So, and it's important that your lawmakers know the Agenda 21 connection in order to understand the origins, the philosophy, and the true purpose behind the plans that they are implementing. So, what is sustainable development? Sustainable development is about a planned central economy and redistribution of wealth on a local, state, national, and international level. The process by which it is implemented creates a matrix of locked away land or severe land use controls, control of energy and energy production, control of transportation, control of industry, control of food production, control of development, control of water availability, and control of population size and growth. Most of their policies and regulations are issued under the excuse of protecting the environment. This is the process through which America is being transformed. It is what your elected officials are really doing as they use terms like comprehensive development plans, 
energy audits, open space, and historic preservation. That is Agenda 21 and sustainable development. Agenda 21 is not just policy. It is a complete system to change the way we think, the way we react, the way we make decisions. And those who promote it have very specific ideas as to how they want you to answer each of these things. That's why it's called an agenda. Let me show you what I mean. The Sustainable Development logo used in most literature on the subject contains three connecting circles. Each one's labeled. One is labeled social equity, one is economic prosperity, and one is ecological integrity. That logo is basically the blueprint. We know these as the three E's. Let me take them one at a time. Social equity. I will tell you straight out, if you fail to grasp the social equity plank of sustainable development, then you simply have no grasp of this issue, period. Social equity is based on a demand for social justice. Social justice is described as the right and opportunity of all people to benefit equally from the resources afforded us by society and the environment. That is a nice way of saying redistribution of wealth. And by the way, Karl Marx was the first to coin the term social justice. Today, the phrase is used throughout sustainableist literature, and it is the root of new policy initiatives. The sustainableist system is based on the principle that individuals must give up selfish wants for the needs of the common good or the community. This is the same policy behind the push to eliminate our nation's borders, to allow the migration of those from other nations into the United States to share our individually created wealth and our taxpayer paid government social programs. Borders, they say, stop the natural migration of the human race. National sovereignty, they say, is a social injustice. According to the sustainableists, it is a social injustice for some to have prosperity if others do not. Profits are made at the expense of the people. And so, sustainable policy is developed from that starting position. As a result, social equity through sustainable development is a means to a forced utopia with promises of health care for all, jobs for all, housing for all, and equality for all. Goombaya. <laughs> so, the reason the government refuses to secure our borders is because it is committed to imposing sustainable development. The reason Congress refused to listen to your pleas against centralized health care is because it is committed to imposing sustainable development. Simply do a Google search for the words sustainable medicine, and you will find more than 5,800,000 references containing most of the provisions of Obamacare. And incredibly, a new social justice plank making its way through state governments is called, are you ready? Gross National Happiness. The GNH. Under the health plank of Agenda 21, it is an attempt to qualify in psychological terms general well-being. If allowed to move forward, gross national happiness will slowly replace gross national product as a standard to measure the health of the nation. Rather than using economics, it will measure social trends that affect quality of life. You know all those surveys your kids have to fill out in school? It'll be part of the gross national happiness survey. And this is combined with, are you ready? The Happy Planet Index, the HPI, developed by the New Economy Foundation with support from the Friends of the Earth, and I'm quite sure several of your tax dollars. At its core, the Happy Planet Index argues that long and happy lives must be the economy's ultimate goal and not merely all that insatiable economic stuff. 
and you wonder why the economy is collapsing as the rantings from a bad LSD trip it becomes serious policy actually considered by real government agencies. What I've just revealed to you come from official documents from the state of Maryland and more. Last week in Tennessee, there was a major rally demanding gross national happiness. The second of the three E's, economic prosperity. The international system of Agenda 21 encompasses the free trade movement that created the North American Free Trade Agreement, or NAFTA, and public-private partnerships, all pulled together in a government-driven economy called corporatism. It is not capitalism or free markets, though it may have some of the trappings. The marketplace is still there, but ultimately, corporatism does not trust the marketplace to do what the elites want done. The partnerships allow for special tax breaks, access to land for some developers, but not for others, non-compete clauses in government projects that guarantee profits, access to grants and lucrative special government uh, projects, and much more. Under public-private partnerships, there is a guarantee of, of protection and profits. Corporations that play ball get the power of government and government gets the hide behind the independence of private business. Thus, the partnership between corporations and government is done at the expense of ordinary people, the exact opposite of free markets controlled by consumers. This is the new way business is being run in America under sustainable development. The business plan of the day, lobby for regulations. They argue that it is good for the economy, creating jobs by destroying things from the past. They say it's good for the economy to enforce regulations to make people buy things they didn't need before. It's certainly not free enterprise or open markets. The true description is government-sanctioned monopolies right out of the Mussolini fascist playbook. And the 30 ecological integrity. Well, this is the excuse for it all. To understand the power of the transformation of society under sustainable development, consider this quote from the UN's Biodiversity Treaty, which was also introduced at the 1992 Earth Summit. It says, quote, nature has an integral set of different values, cultural, spiritual, and material, where humans are one strand in nature's web and all living creatures are considered equal. Therefore, the natural way is the right way, and human activities should be molded along nature's rhythms." End quote. This quote lays down the ground rules for, for the entire sustainable development agenda. It says, humans are nothing special. Just one strand in the nature of things, or put another way, humans are simply biological resources. Sustainable policy is to oversee any issue in which man interacts with nature, which of course is literally everything. This is necessary, sustainable say, because humans only defile nature. In other words, sustainable's view man is nothing more than a swarm of locusts which swoop down on nature and sucks it clean until there's nothing left, nothing good comes from man, according to sustainable's doctrine. And private property ownership and control is a main target of sustainable development. Consider this quote from the report of the 1976 UN Habitat One conference, which said, quote, land cannot be treated as an ordinary asset controlled by individuals and subject to the pressures uh, and inefficiencies of the market. Private land ownership is also a principal instrument of accumulation and concentration of wealth and therefore contributes to social injustice, end quote. The fact is, Agenda 21 is a blueprint to completely change our society to a top-down, planned central economy in a strange mixture of socialism, fascism, and corporatism. To convince Americans to accept it required that they would have to get us to sacrifice our, na our natural rights voluntarily. The answer? environmental Armageddon. 
You must sacrifice freedom to protect the planet. It's urgent, we're told. Do you doubt that? Then consider this quote by Alexander King, co-founder of the Club of Rome. He said, quote, In searching for a new enemy to unite us, we came up with the idea that pollution, the threat of global warming, water shortages, famine and the like, would fit the bill. All of these dangers are caused by human intervention. The real enemy, then, is humanity. So the urgency is on. Global warming and climate change are feeding the hysteria. There's no time to consider things like individual concerns and wants and needs. Selfish cries the sustainableness. We must save the environment. Go green. Get out of your cars. Stop using energy. Sacrifice. Cut your carbon footprint or perish. And so, federal and state governments, working hand in hand with a horde of non-governmental organizations, private groups with personal political agendas, force passage of rules and regulations passed down to local communities. But, say your local officials, none of that UN stuff, uh, socialist stuff is true, just conspiracy theories from right-wing radicals. We're just creating the tools necessary in a local effort to manage growth and development for our community, they say. Have you heard these? Then consider this quote from J. Gary Lawrence, a planner for the city of Seattle and an advisor to the President's Council on Sustainable Development. He said, quote, Participating in a UN-advocated planning process would very likely bring out many who would actively work to defeat any elected official undertaking Local Agenda 21. So, we will call our process something else, such as comprehensive planning, growth management, or smart growth. Local indeed. The sustainable development is the process by which America is being reorganized around the central principle of state collectivism using the environment as bait. This is a political movement led by those who seek to control the world economy, dictate development, and redistribute the world's wealth. They use the philosophical base of Karl Marx, the tactics of Adolf Hitler, and the rhetoric of the Sierra Club. Everything connected with sustainable development translates to higher costs, shortages, and sacrifice. And the best way to understand what sustainable development actually is can be found by discovering what is not sustainable. Maurice Strong, Secretary General of the UN's Earth Summit in 1992 said, quote, current lifestyles and consumption patterns of the affluent middle class involving high meat intake Use of fossil fuels, appliances, home and work air conditioning, and suburban housing are not sustainable. So, how is this wrenching transformation being put into place? There are four very specific routes being used. In the rural areas, it's called the Wildman's Project. In the cities, it's called Smart Growth. In business, it's called Public-Private Partnerships. And in government, it's called stakeholder councils and non-elected boards and regional government or reinvented government. Let's take them one at a time. The Wildlands Project was the brainchild of Earth First Day Foreman, and it literally calls for rewilding 50% of all the land in every state back to the way it was before Christopher Columbus stepped foot here. Think about that. In 1983, when Foreman first dreamed up the scheme for the Wildlands Project, he said, quote, it is not enough to preserve the roadless, undeveloped country remaining. We must recreate wilderness in large regions, move out the cars and civilized people, dismantle the roads and dams, reclaim the plowed lands and clear cuts, and reintroduce extirpated species. Destruction of human civilization was his goal. In reality, the Wildlands Project is a diabolical plan to herd people off the rural areas and into human settlements. <clears throat> Crazy, you say? Well, yeah. Impossible? Not so fast. From the demented mind of Dave Foreman, 
The plan became the blueprint of the UN's Biodiversity Treaty. So now the scheme is international in scope with the power of law. Thomas Lovejoy, a science advisor for the Federal Department of Interior, said, quote, we will map the whole nation, determine development for the whole country, and regulate it. And your local elected officials are helping to implement this insanity. Yet they're quick to deny that such ideas have their origins on the international level, and they accuse me of wearing a tinfoil hat and hearing voices. <laughs> well, here's a voice I hear. Again, Maurice Strong said at the UN's Earth Summit, quote, isn't the only hope for the planet that the industrialized nations collapse? Isn't it our responsibility to bring that about? Is that not what you hear in the news every night? The collapse of the industrialized nations? And that is the true agenda we face. But how do you remove people from the land one step at a time? There are many tools in place to stop human activity and grow the wilderness. Deny grazing and water rights on public lands. It becomes more difficult and more expensive to run the farm or the ranch, and eventually it goes out of business. Lock away natural resources by creating national parks. It shuts down the mines, and they go out of business. Call every mosquito-infested swamp and occasional mud puddle a wetlands, and ban any development around it. Invent a spotted owl shortage and pretend it can't live in a forest where timber is cut. Shuts off the forest. Then when no trees are cut, there's nothing to feed the mills, and then there are no jobs, and then they go out of business, and in fact, whole towns go out of business. In the state of Maryland, they are considering a plan to ban septic tanks as a means to protect the Chesapeake Bay even though there is no evidence that septic tanks do any damage whatsoever. In fact, they've proven to be one of the best inventions we ever had. The only result of the ban will be to make it impossible to live in a rural area unless you want to spend millions, several millions of dollars on a private water treatment plant. The Wildlands Project comes in many names and many programs. Wilderness areas, comprehensive land use plans, bikeways, greenways, heritage areas, land management, rails to trails, open space, wolf and bear reintroduction, conservation easements, and many more. Each of these programs is designed to make it just a little harder to live on the land, a little more expensive, a little more hopeless. In reality, the process is simply herding people off rural land and into human habitat areas or cities. The second path to sustainable development is called smart growth. They put a line around the city and tell you no growth can take place outside of that line. Urban sprawl, they say disdainfully. They refuse to build more roads as a ploy to get you out of your car and into public transportation, restricting mobility. Now, new highways, they say, are feeders to more development, so it must be stopped. They even stop the widening of existing roads for the same reason. So roads become overcrowded and gridlocked, and they blame development. Their new ploy is to force cars to share the road with bikes, the complete street, they call it. And in many smart growth cities, new apartment buildings now have no garages or parking lots. We don't want any stinking cars here. Smart growth creates an unnatural restriction on space inside the controlled city limits. What happens? There's a shortage of houses and prices go up. And that means populations will have to be controlled because now there's a shortage of land. And that's why kind, compassionate environmentalist Dr. Jacques Cousteau declared, in quote, in order to stabilize world populations, we must eliminate 350,000 people per day. Sustainables call for 85% reduction in human populations. Now, after we're done here tonight, we have set up out outside here in the hall some containers of Kool-Aid. <laughs> we would like all of you to do your patriotic duty 
and go out and drink some, and you won't have any environmentalist in your way blocking it because they won't get in that line. 85% reduction in human population. How's that done? Do we use the proven success of China's population control methods and of forced abortions and sterilizations? The Chinese, I can tell you, are huge supporters of sustainable development, and I'm sure that they've got some great ideas they can share with us about getting rid of people. <laughs> of course, comprehensive development plans are the tool of choice in nearly every city in the nation to produce the proper smart growth community. Through these plans, energy and water use is tightly controlled. You control the water, you control everything. Smart growth advocates force individuals to live in denser communities that take up smaller tracts of land per housing unit. Planning advocates and government bureaucrats are forcing such planning communities across the state and the nation, and those put plans put severe controls on private property. The fact of the matter is, in a smart growth community, there can be no private property. It's community. And the third way to sustainable development inside the human habitat areas, our cities and our towns, government is steadily being controlled by an elite ruling class called stakeholder councils. These are mostly NGOs who, like thieves in the night, just show up and stake their claim to enforce their own private agendas. The function of legitimate elected government within the sustainable system is fast becoming little more than a rubber stamp to create and enforce the dictates of the council. It's the demise of representative government. And the councils appear and grow almost overnight. You'll find watershed councils that regulate human action near every trickling steam, uh, stream, river, or lake. Meters are put on wells. Special action councils control home size, tree pruning, or removal. Even the color you can paint your home or the height of your grass. Historic preservation councils control development in downtown areas, disallowing expansion and new, build and new building. Sometimes they even disallow repairs on existing buildings unless specific, expensive, perhaps non-existent materials are used. In rural areas, we find the establishment of fire safety councils that prevent those living in wooded areas from removing vegetation and dead trees from wooded areas or on their own land because to do so wouldn't be natural and damages the economy, the ecology. And that's why the fires are burning so hot in the West now. So as a result, forests can't be cut Farmers pay taxes to draw their own water and their own wells. Commercial fishermen can't fish. And regulations cover all possible human activity. Once the councils are established, it becomes nearly impossible to discuss issues with your elected representatives. <clears throat> Instead, they will automatically refer to you, you to the proper council or administration or department run by unresponsive appointed hacks armed with their own political agendas. These non-elected councils fit almost perfectly the definition of a state Soviet, a system of councils that report to an apex council and then implement a predetermined outcome. Soviets are the operating mechanism of a government-controlled economy, the exact opposite of a constitutional republic. And the fourth path to sustainable development, as I mentioned earlier, public-private partnerships. You hear the propaganda of the public-private partnerships nightly on your television as their commercials tell you to go green. And they use Congress to build more wealth and power. GE and Sylvania use their partnership with government to ban their own product, the incandescent light bulb, and replace it with the new green bulbs by next year, you won't be allowed to buy incandescent bulbs. Why? Because GE can make three times as much for the new ones because they're more expensive. Such is the reality of green industry. In fact, there would be no green industry if not for the billions of dollars in grant money shelled out to the partnerships to develop alternative energy schemes. The fact is, 
Wind energy may well be the least sustainable and least eco-friendly of all electricity options. In fact, it probably requires more energy to manufacture, haul, and install these monstrous windmills and their transmission systems than that windmill will ever generate in its life. Yet the nation, in the name of sustainable development, is investing everything in our future to enforce these windmills over real energy providers. Alternative energy amounts to less than 1% of our energy needs. And for every green job created, two in legitimate industry are lost because of green rules and regulations. America has now discovered it has a near infinite amount of shale oil in literally every single state. Rather than celebrate our good fortune to reduce gas prices and eliminate dependency on foreign oil cartels, the sustainableists are rushing in a near panic to block the drilling of shale oil. You see, to the sustainableist elite who loathe competition in free markets, such a change in the status quo is terrifying because their control is highly profitable for those industries as they take the tax money through the public-private partnerships. And now, there is a new kind of corporation being developed through public-private partnerships. If you're taking notes, write this down. It's called benefit corporations. As my friend Michael Shaw, Freedom Advocates, describes it, imagine a legislated brotherhood of business where favored businesses get to go to the front of the line for permits, licenses, and opportunities merely because they agree to advance the principles of sustainable development in Agenda 21. Six states already have benefit corporation legislation. Hawaii, Virginia, Maryland, Vermont, New Jersey, and New York. And six more Actually, five more. I, I had to change this because I used to say New York was considering it. I learned last night they passed it with no opposition whatsoever. Five more are in the process of making it part of their state corporate legal system, including California, of course, Colorado, Michigan, North Carolina, and Pennsylvania. This policy will destroy free enterprise for good and guarantee that we cannot stop Agenda 21. Now, many Americans ask how dangerous international policies can suddenly turn up in local government, all seemingly uniform, to those in communities across the nation and around the globe. The answer? Meet ICLEI, a nonprofit, private foundation dedicated to helping your mayor implement all of his policies. Originally known as the International Council for Local Environmental Initiatives, ICLEI, they changed their name to get rid of the international word, and today the group simply calls itself ICLEI, Local Governments for Sustainability. But in 1992, ICLEI was one of the groups instrumental in creating Agenda 21. They then made it their mission to go around the world in local communities and begin to help those communities implement it. And it's having tremendous success. ICLEI is now operating in more than 600 cities in all 50 states. The group is shooting for 1,000 member cities in the next three years. Each of these cities paid dues to ICLEI to receive its programs. When local governments contract with ICLEI, they agree to implement Agenda 21 policy and sustainable development. And here's just some of the programs ICLEI provides cities and towns in order to spread their own particular political agenda in the name of community services and environmental protection. They bring in software products and associated training, access to net a network of experts, newsletters, conferences, training workshops, toolkits, online resources, case studies, fact sheets, policy and practice manuals. And what do they do with all of that? It's all aimed at the employees of your city city hall or your county administration. 
These tools are used to carefully and fully indoctrinate these employees to assure only sustainable policies are considered. And then there's this one, the big one. Notification of relevant grant opportunities. Money with severe strings attached. Grants that they helped create in the first place and they know full well how when you take that money, maybe just to revitalize downtown, it comes with all the strings and you've taken the town's taken the Kool-Aid and now you can't turn back. Around the nation, Bigley partners with others, established organizations like the American Planning Association and the International City County Management Association or the ICMA. And then there's the Renaissance Planning Group. There are these groups and hundreds more like them work hand in hand with groups like the U.S. Conference of Mayors, the National Governors Association, the National League of Cities, the National Association of County Administrators, and more that your local representatives probably belong to. We are now finding that while ICLEI is a convenient target because of its obvious ties to the UN, the American Planning Association may be the most dangerous player in the game. That's because the APA is in literally every city trusted as a legitimate, non-controversial, established organization. It's been around almost 100 years. Nothing here to tie it to some international UN conspiracy, we're told. Well, again, not so fast. The APA just issued its new planning guide sent to every community in the nation. A quick look through it finds references to social justice, smart growth, promotion of affordable housing, protection of, that's paid for by your tax dollars, by the way, protection of farmland, uh, stopping urban sprawl, combining cl uh, uh, combating climate change, dealing with homelessness, energy preservation, provisions for child care, and more, all out of the social justice plank of Agenda 21. These are the people who are making policy. These are the people your local elected officials trust to be mainstream. These are the true enemy of freedom in America. That's how these policies quickly spread across the nation as enforced regulations. And here are some of the results of those efforts. Across the nation, state legislatures are passing laws requiring cities and towns to establish comprehensive development. That include high-density urban development areas, controls on energy and water, controls on transportation, making it more difficult to drive cars, perhaps forcing acceptance of light rail and high-speed trains. These laws are now being used as a weapon to force sustainable development at a rapid pace across the nation. Comprehensive development plans in city after city across the nation are enforcing schemes to cut their carbon footprint by controlling energy use. And here's some of what you can expect from these plans that your city fathers say will make things better. One of the most popular tools now to control energy use is the energy audit and building review. They establish quotas for electrical use and for heating and cooling pumps and water use, weatherization of existing buildings, replacement of incandescent light bulbs and so forth. That means that government bureaucrats will come into your home or your office building and determine the amount of potential energy you should have. You will be given a list of recommendations necessary to bring your home into compliance. These may include the need for a new roof, new energy efficient appliances, new windows, etc. In Oakland, California, the city council did just these things. And the result was an average cost to every single homeowner of at least $35,000. And if you don't comply, you will be fined and possibly unable to sell your home until you do. Across the nation, power companies in partnership with uh, government planners are forcing the use of smart meters. Those meters contain RFID chips the technology enables the power company to keep track of how much power you are using and control, regulate, and ration your use of that electricity. They will set the temperature in your home. 
If they decide that you're using too much hot water for your showers or washing machines or too much air conditioning, your electricity will automatically be turned down or even off. Moreover, a future goal is to have all appliances replaced with those containing those same RFID chips which the smart meter will speak to for more regulations and controls. And those who, pr who protest that such meters are a violation of, the pr of private property rights and freedom of choice are told that their only choice is to accept the meters or have no electricity in their home. And it just keeps getting wilder. Under the title of sustainable farming, the planners are excited about a new sustainable style of tractor to pull the plows. It's called a team of oxen. <laughs> and, all, and they're serious. There is a college in Vermont that teaches sustainable farming and they have a herd of oxen. Students are paying for an education to learn Davy Crockett's farming techniques. In San Diego, California, there have been no new docks built in that harbor for 25 years because the, dock, the docks hide the sun from the plankton underneath. There are now policies being advocated to place taxes on the use of toilet paper, on the number of miles you drive in your car, and on the use of plastic bags. Well, in Washington, D.C., they just ban the bags. Get that out of the way. Next on the agenda is to, quote, radically abandon the flush toilet. They call it, quote, one of the world's most destructive habits. Shame on you. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation have made a donation of $3 million to eight universities to reinvent the flush toilet. The EPA is now providing funding to NGO groups to run training programs for people to photograph and report neighbors who may be committing crimes against the environment. This summer, Obama signed Executive Order 13575 to create the White House Rural Council. The council is a list of the most aggressive agencies and departments of the U.S. government. It will bring an army of regulators into rural areas to completely control every decision of land use, farming, and development. It will even affect curriculum in schools. Farmers who have been feeding America for over 200 years will not be able to make a single decision without permission and massive paperwork from bureaucrats from over 25 agencies lapping, overlapping, and lapping again. The result will only be food shortages and higher prices. Welcome to the utopia of sustainable development. This is Big Brother at its worst and its plan, control, enforced by your local leaders and representatives in partnership with ICLEI, an organization whose vice chairman, chairman Her, uh, Her, excuse me, Harvey Rubin, said, quote, individual rights will have to take a back seat to the collective. Now I ask you this. Would any of your elected officials admit to enforcing communism in your community? Of course not then why are they so eager to be in partnership with an organization which does? The United States is not a global village run by elders who hand down the rules from on high. We are a nation of individuals whose rights are supposed to be protected and guaranteed by the representatives we elect. We demand accountability from them. However, global forces which do not accept the unique American form of government sneak behind the curtain, avoiding controversy and honest debate. The only possible result can be a tyranny over a powerless electorate stripped of their rights, their property, and their self-determination. Global warming has been the excuse for the hysteria, but true science is now showing that to be the greatest hoax ever perpetrated on humankind. So there's no need for these dire policies to cut back our carbon footprint by forcing us to lock away land and resources and live in high-density cracker boxes. We all want 
a clean environment. However, what we are objecting to here is not environmental protection, but the process that is being used in its name. There's nothing local or innocent or normal about it. This is an international agenda created by ideological zealots working hand in hand through massive international gatherings sponsored through the United Nations. At those massive meetings, documents are carefully prepared for the signatures of leaders of every nation. Once signed, the bureaucracies of the nation use documents like Agenda 21 as a blueprint for legislation and regulations. To write that legislation, the bureaucrats work hand in hand with the same zealots who wrote the UN documents it's based on, and then these same UN sanctioned NGOs such as the Sierra Club and the Nature Conservancy team up with local groups like the American Planning Association to apply pressure and make sure local city councils and county supervisors toe the line. The resulting non-elected boards, councils, and regional governments appointed by an ecologarchy answerable to no one is the perfect definition of a Soviet essentially controlled economy. And ladies and gentlemen, I assure you, we cannot restore our unique American Republic if our communities are little Soviets. Nor can we protect the environment if our economy is destroyed and free men are unable to make choices other than survival in a sustainableist tyranny. The sustainableists are using our carbon footprint as a measure of our guilt. One fact is sure. If you have no carbon footprint, you are dead. <laughs> Elected officials can no longer play ignorant about the origins of their policies. America is dying while they are denying. It is their elected duty to represent the people and protect them from these piranhas that are devouring our, our way of life. To save it, you must take action now. And understand that the main battle is being fought not in Congress, right here on the local level. If America is to survive, you and I must stop sustainable development in Agenda 21 now at every level of government. We must stand up and protest at every city council and county commissioner meeting, at every planning board, and at every consensus meeting. Fight the creation of non-elected councils, commissions, or boards because they can and they will be used as a weapon against your ability to deal and reason with local government. Above all, refuse federal or state money or new sustainable programs and get rid of the old ones. And if ICLEI and the American Planning Association are now running things in your town, and they are, throw them out. Stop payment of dues, disband anything that they have built, and start looking for some high-grade tar and feathers. <laughs> and if, if your elected representatives continue to ignore you while playing footsie with those leading this tyranny, then you must force them out of office. Your survival depends on it. Nameless, faceless bureaucrats wielding power in the back rooms, untouched and unseen, is not freedom. The sustainableists now haunt the upper levels of the federal government, our state houses, and our city council chambers. In these very dangerous times, it is easy to despair over our nation's future. They have achieved many of their goals, but they have not yet won. Their whole agenda is built on a house of cards that stands only when you are ignorant and compliant. And their arrogance and their impatience to force the policy into place is resulting in a stir of the American people. We are beginning to move the rock of freedom uphill. We are on the threshold of great change because the, world is, the word is quickly spreading about Agenda 21. After 18 years of issuing warnings about Agenda 21, finally, opposition is being heard. In the past 10 months, at least 10 communities have taken action and revoked contracts with ICLEI. It started in January with Carroll County, Maryland, then Amador County, California, then Montgomery County, Pennsylvania, then Edmond, Oklahoma, then Las Cruces, New Mexico, then Spartanburg, South Carolina, then Albemarle County, Virginia, the home of Thomas Jefferson, 
then Plantation, Florida, then James City County, Virginia, where America basically started in Jamestown. And just most recently, Lexington, Virginia, rejected its contract with Ickley. And there's more. In the Washington State Legislature, they are establishing an anti-Agenda 21 caucus. In Bonner County, Idaho, County Commissioner Cornell Razor is working to establish a property rights council as an official arm of the county government. It will oversee all legislation coming before the county commission and will determine if it violates private property rights. And just this past week, I participated in a national conference uh, call of activists to help move the Property Rights Council idea across the nation. Activists in Tennessee are already moving to implement the idea. The state legislature in Wisconsin now has a bill before it to allow local community governments to repeal comprehensive development plans they were forced to put together under smart growth legislation. It also eliminates the grant program that was set up to finance the smart growth schemes. And finally, Florida state legislature has passed and the governor has signed legislation to repeal smart growth legislation for the whole state. That means that now the counties are free from state mandates. This is landmark legislation. And every day I talk to activists across the nation hoping to be the next community to kick these zealots out. In several counties, anti-Agenda 21 candidates are starting to appear on ballots. Some of them are even determined, so determined that they're running as write-ins. In a panic, Ickley is now rushing to cleanse its website of any mention of Agenda 21. <laughs> Our opponents are trying their best to ridicule us and paint us as a movement of extremists. It's not working. We are getting stronger every day. For the first time since I started down the road to expose Agenda 21, I believe we will succeed in crushing it. You know, recently I, I watched the film Robin Hood starring Russell Crowe. And I was struck by the similarities between England of the 13th century and today's America. It was a time of serfs who had no, prop, no rights, no property, and only poverty in their future. It was a time when the king owned everything from land to livestock. And it was a time when tax collectors could literally confiscate everything you had in the name of the king, leaving you with virtually nothing. The people attempted to rise up and demand that their king give them legal rights from which they could be guaranteed the ability to benefit from the fruits of their own labor. The people of the 13th century England knew what they had to do if ever they were going to be free. The slogan under which they organized was rise and rise again until lambs become lions. Today, as we face an ever-growing tyranny by a government and a president, as well as elected officials on every level who ignore you, lie to you, deny their actions that you can plainly see, Americans, for the first time in history, face the same evil those Englishmen faced so long ago. And so today, I appeal to you to take that same resolve. Today, begin that effort to rise up and continue to fight again and again on city, at city council and county commission meetings, take their ridicule and return the fight again. Stand up to these self-proclaimed stakeholders and outsider NGOs, the carpetbaggers of our day. Reach out to your neighbors and help them see what a threat Agenda 21 is to their freedom. Never give in. Rise and rise again until lands become lost. Thank you.